terrified of cough right now, but not all coughs are COVID related, nor do all COVID patients cough. But what are the symptoms of this disease and what do I need to worry then? Well, in most cases, the infection manifests with flu-like symptoms. And the most common, according to early studies from China, are fever in almost all patients, normally above 37.5 Celsius degrees, and often also above 38 Celsius degrees, coughing in more than half of the patients, tiredness in slightly less than half of the patients, and also often associated with muscle pain, sputum in less than half of the patients, and dyspnea in about one-third of the patients. In addition to these symptoms, some, which means like less than 20%, have atypical symptoms, such as headache, sore throat, diarrhea, and vomiting, reduced or absent taste or smell, even with no cough or sneeze. Unfortunately, these symptoms are very common, and even in case of fever or cough alone, it is pretty much impossible to tell whether it is COVID or not without the test. So, if in doubt, don't go out, stay home. But if I have no symptoms, can I consider myself healthy? Unfortunately, no. In fact, there are two important points to consider. Number one, from the infection, it takes up to 14 days for symptoms to manifest. And this period is called incubation period. Be careful. The fact that you have no symptoms yet does not necessarily mean that you are healthy because during the incubation period, you can still infect other people. And number two, half of those infected show no symptoms. And apparently, the number of asymptomatic patients may be even higher. If, on the one hand, this is a positive aspect for those who get infected, on the other hand, it poses serious epidemiological problems. In fact, since these people are healthy carriers of the virus, they carry out their daily activities, go to work or to the grocery store as usual, and, unaware of the infection, will infect other people. While well, the infection may therefore look like a simple flu or show no signs at all. However, unfortunately, there is also a third scenario. The infection may evolve and cause serious complications. Well, it can evolve into interstitial pneumonia, the most common complication, which, in the most severe cases, may evolve into acute respiratory distress syndrome. ARDS. Then, septic leg shock, which may also be present with no bacterial infection, as in this case, metabolic acidosis, coagulative dysfunctions, with consequent possible thrombosis or embolisms, multi organ failure, mainly of heart, kidney, and liver, bacterial superinfections that occur in parallel with the viral infection. In general, they are caused by the direct attack of the virus on the cell of the lung alveoli, prolonged immune activation in response to the infection, and incorrect oxygenation of the blood due to lung damage. But these complications seem to be quite rare in young subjects. While the people at greater risk are generally the elderly, usually aged like 60 to 70 years old, and then males and people with previous underlying pathologies, as in the case of hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, and many others. It is precisely in these individuals that the pathology tends to develop a more severe clinical picture, often leading to death. It's still not completely clear why these patients are at greater risk though. Presumably, the reason lies in an increased tissue predisposition for virus replication. These are patients whose organs are physiologically aging, and in possible bacterial superinfections, they may occur in conjunction with COVID-19. 
Now, let's move on to the more medical aspect of the infection. In laboratory analysis, the most common observation is that of an inflammatory picture, which is the key to the pathophysiology of COVID. Increase of pro-inflammatory signals, cytokines, CRP, etc., and signs of cell damage. Well, this is the general clinical picture of COVID-19. It may seem like a simple flu, but it's not always that. The mortality rate of COVID-19 currently estimated at the global level to be around 7%. Anyway, it seems that the number of infected people is much higher and, from a certain point of view, this is good news because it seems that the mortality rate is much lower. Watch out though, this number, apparently low, is actually 50 to 60 times higher than the seasonal flu death rate, although lower than SARS mortality rate, which is about 10%. So, by now, the most important thing is to not underestimate it.